Stanford University. We are back. Lecture 9, Stanford CS 193P, spring of 2020. Today we are going to talk about a super important topic, property wrappers. We're finally going to understand what things like at sign stayed and at sign published are really doing under the covers. And we're going to talk about publishers because when we start talking about at sign published, it's going to rapidly lead to this other topic, also another very important topic. However, I only have a little bit of time to talk about it today. We will talk about it much more later in the quarter. I'm just going to get the overview today. And then we'll dive into a demo where I'll show you a lot of stuff about publishers and also talk about at sign binding, which is a new property wrapper you're going to learn about in these slides. So let's talk about property wrappers. These are the at sign somethings that you're seeing, at sign state, at sign publisher. Turns out this thing is actually a struct, and that struct has code in it that applies some kind of template behavior to all the vars that they wrap. We already know about some of these behaviors like at sign state, it makes a var live in the heap, right? It makes it writable in a view that would otherwise be unwritable. We know that at sign publish publishes the changes of a var, causing views to redraw and things like that. Same thing with at sign observed object. To watching our view model. When it changes, it makes our view redraw. Property wrappers is a feature in the Swift language that adds some syntactic sugar to make these structs really easy to use in your code. So let's talk about that syntactic sugar. And to do that, we're going to use this example, at sign publish var emoji of type emoji art equals emoji art. We have this in our emoji art demo. What's really happening here? Well, as I said, this line of code is really creating a struct. And what type is that struct? It's of type published. That is the type of this struct. And inside this struct, there is a very important var called its wrapped value. Now, the type of this wrapped value var for most property wrappers is the type of the var it's wrapping, that emoji art thing. So that's of type emoji art. That's awesome. It's got that little wrap value in there, which is an emoji art. Swift, when you do this at sign published, it builds one of these structs and makes a couple of vars available to you. The first one is underbar emoji art. Now we have not seen this one, but it's in there. Underbar emoji art is of type published. It's a make basically of the type of this struct that we're talking about here. And it gets initialized by creating a published struct and setting that wrapped value to whatever you initialized the var that you're wrapping. All right, emoji art up there, we initialize it to an empty emoji art. So our published struct gets initialized with that wrapped value there. So that makes a lot of sense. Now we don't actually access this purple underbar emoji art very often. However, it's there, and we do access this next var, which looks just like the thing we're wrapping, this flashing up there, var emoji art, but that turns out to be a computed property. And conceptually, it's getting the wrapped value out of the underbar emoji art, and it's setting by setting the underbar emoji art's wrapped value. So that's really what's going on here conceptually. Now there's more to it than that. Of course, this published is just a struct and it can do a lot of different things with wrap value, but this is basically what's going on. But wait, there's more. There's yet another var in that struct called the projected value. You access this projected value with yet another syntactic sugar var, dollar emoji art. So we have underbar emoji art, that's the struct, you have nothing in front of it emoji art that's getting the wrapped value via computed property. And then you have dollar emoji art, which is accessing this projected value. Well, what is this projected value? Well, that's totally up to the property wrapper. So each property wrapper has a different projected value that it's totally its decision. For example, at sign published, that struct, it chooses to have its projected value be a publisher that publishes the wrapped value and never fails. That's what this type publisher angle bracket emoji art comma never means. It means a publisher that is periodically emitting a value, which is an emoji art, 
and never fails. Now, of course, the value that is periodically emitting is any time that wrapped value, that emoji art changes, it publishes that change. And we're gonna talk about publishers later, and this will make more sense to you, but that is the projected value of an at sign published property wrapper. And each one is gonna have a different type, so we're gonna to have to go through and talk about each of those on a case-by-case -case basis. But first, let's talk about why we do this property wrapper thing. Well, what's the point of it? Well, the main point is that the wrapper struck, like published, can do something when the wrap value is got or set, right? It can get involved. For example, at sign publish, what does it do when its wrap value is set? Well, it publishes it through its little dollar emoji art publisher. Not only that, but at sign publish causes object will change dot send to happen in the observable object it's in. So it's getting involved in the setting and getting of that var, and that's what property wrappers really do. So let's look at the actions that are taken and the projected value of each of the property wrappers that we know. At sign state, we've seen that one multiple times in our view. The wrapped value of an at sign state is anything, really, any var, probably going to be a value type. What it does, it stores the wrap value in the heap. And that's so that it can be changeable, because normally our views are read-only, we can't change it, but if it lives in the heap, we can change it over there. It also invalidates the view whenever that wrapped value changes. Now, what is its projected value? It's dollar sign. It's not a publisher. It's called a binding. We're going to talk all about bindings in a couple slides here. But a binding is essentially a way to connect one var to another. So taking the dollar sign value of a state lets you have an object that you can use to bind to that value in the heap. So we'll see what that binding means in a second. The next one is observed object. What's the wrapped value of an observed object? It's anything that implements the observable object protocol. View models, basically. What does at sign observed object struct do? Well, it invalidates the view whenever the wrapped value of the view model does object will change dot send. Whenever that happens, it redraws the view. That's what observed object does. Now, what's its projected value? It's dollar sign thing. It's also a binding, a binding to the vars of the view model, which is really cool. So you can bind a variable in your view to a variable in the view model so that if either changes, the other one gets updated. And what about binding itself? So we haven't seen this one, at sign binding, it's a property wrapper. The wrapped value of at sign binding is a value that's bound to some other thing somewhere else, like it's bound to the vars of a view model. It's bound to an at sign state in some other view. An at sign binding struct gets the value and sets the value of the wrap value by getting and setting the value of this other thing. It also invalidates the view. So what is the projected value of a binding? It's self. It's essentially the binding itself. If you get the dollar sign of a var that's a binding, you're going to be getting that binding itself back. Or you can think of it as it's a binding to the value that the binding is bound to, but it's essentially self. Let's talk about these bindings more because it's all new. Where do we use bindings? We use them all over the place. And I'm not even going to go through this list. It's so exhausting. There's so many things we use for bindings. But I'm going to talk about why we have bindings, why we use them to do all these things. Bindings are about one of the most important things in the MVVM reactive UI structure of Swift UI. It's about having a single source of the truth for data. That is so important. If we have data in our model, it wants to live in our model. We do not want it duplicated in our views, right? If we have information in one view in an at sign state, and we have information in another view in its at sign state, if that's the same information, they should be bound to each other instead of one of them trying to duplicate the other one and which one is the truth. Can't tell. So bindings are about creating variables that connect things together so that only one place has the actual truth. And whether we're talking about truth uh, in the model or that we're just talking about truth in our views, because we might have temporary state in our views, we know we have that with that time state, 
We only want one source of truth for that as well. So let's show you what I mean when I say the source of truth between views. So here I have a view, my view, and it's got some at sign states, some string, my string it's called, initialized to hello. And then I have another view, totally different view down at the bottom there, other view, and it has a var shared text. Its body just shows that shared text via a text, but that var is wrapped with at sign binding. So up above in my view, it's using an other view in its body. And of course, when it creates that other view, it has to initialize all the uninitialized variables in other view. And the first one is that var shared text. And what's the type of that shared text? It's a binding to a string. So how am I gonna pass a binding to a string? I'm gonna use the dollar sign of an at sign state. I told you that dollar sign of at sign state gives you a binding to that state's value. So if I say dollar sign my string, I've got a binding, capital B binding to that string my string. Now, other view has that string, my view has that string, but the source of truth is my view's version, and either of them can change it. Other view could change shared text, and that would change my string in my view. And of course, my view could change my string and it would show up inside other view. So there's not a, you don't make a copy when you create other view, you actually bind it to it. And we're gonna see this in the demo today. This is fundamental to understanding how data flow works in Swift is to understand we want single source of truth and we bind to get that. You can also bind to other things. You can bind to a constant value by doing binding.constant and providing a value. You can even compute the value of the binding. In other words, execute a closure when you try to get the value of the binding and then execute another closure when you try to set it. This feels a lot like computer properties. Uh, that's kind of an advanced topic. You won't have to do that in this class ever, but I just want you to understand how binding is working. It's just hooking up to some data and that data could also be closure, just like a computer bar's data is, is closures. Let's talk about another property wrapper. We know at sign state, we know at sign observed object, and now we know at sign binding. Here's another one, at sign environment object. At sign environment object is almost identical to at sign observed object, but you pass the view model to the view in a little different way. We know that when we have a view and it has a view model, we have a var, which is an at sign observed object, and we usually initialize it by passing it to the view when we create the view. We've done this with the emoji art document. We did it back in Memorize. We actually called the thing view model, which is kind of silly, but that's how we were doing it. So as that at sign environment object, it's doing the same thing. It's holding your view model in your view but you pass it by calling this function dot environment object with the view model as the argument on the view. So you're essentially setting your view model with a view modifier, if you want to think of it that way. Now, what's the difference between these two? Why do they have these two different ways to kind of do the exact same thing? Well, environment objects have this really cool feature, which is that all of the views in your body, if you have an environment object on you, you, they all get that environment object too, without your having to say dot environment object. It's similar to like if we have dot foreground color on a Z stack, that's kind of like we're calling dot foreground color on every single thing inside the, the Z stack. That's not exactly what's happening, but it kind of feels like that. Same thing here. If you have an environment object in a view, then it's like all the views in this body have dot environment object on there. There is a significant exception, which is modal views. And we're gonna talk about modal views a little later. I don't know if the next lecture or maybe the one after, but those kind of views, popovers, alerts, things like that, they do not automatically get the environment object passed to them. Another slight limitation on environment object is that you can only have one environment object wrapper per type of view model in each view. It's not a huge restriction, but you couldn't have two at sign environment objects in the same view that were both memorize the view models. We could have one that's a memorized view model, one that's a emoji view model, but they couldn't both be the same. So minor restriction there. So let's give the environment object the same treatment we gave the other ones. What's its wrapped value? Same as observed object, which is it's any observable object. 
but it's obtained with dot environment object instead of being passed as a var. What does it do, this environment object struct? It invalidates the view when the wrap value does object will change dot send, exactly the same as observed object. And what's its projected value? Again, the same as observed object. You can get at the vars of your view model with the dollar. One more property wrapper called at sign environment. This has nothing to do with environment object. This is a totally different thing. Clear your mind. They have the same first word, but they're different things. So get ready for something totally different, right? First, I have to explain to you that property wrappers can have more variables even than the wrap value and the projected value. Now, if you have more properties, you might need to set them, just like we have unset vars and other structs, we might have the same thing. So how do you pass that in? Well, when you create your property wrapper, like at sign environment, in parentheses, you put the vars. Now, just like in any other struct, you can get rid of the label on the argument. That's quite possible, and environment does this. So environment takes this one argument. Now, <clears throat> the argument there that you're going to give it, which it's going to set one of its internal vars with, is a key path into an environment values struct. So you're just going to look environment values up in the documentation, and you're going to see the long, long list of the things you can find out about your environment. For example, here I'm using the key path dot color scheme. And so environment values dot color scheme is the current light mode or dark mode of the environment you're running in, essentially. Now note that the color scheme up there, outside environment color scheme, it says var color scheme. It doesn't say the type. There's no colon anything up there. And it is perfectly allowed for a property wrapper to have the wrapped values type be set internally. And that's what environment does. And it sets the type of the var there, color scheme in that case, to whatever the, is the type of the key path that you're passing to it. So for example, color scheme in environment values is of type color scheme, capital C, capital S, which is an enum. And that enum just has two values, dot dark and dot light. That just tells you whether you're in dark mode or light mode right now. So that's really great because when you're drawing your view, you can know what mode you're in. And there are dozens of other things. It's all about the environment values struct. Go take a look at there. And you could, yes, you can even have your own ones. We're not going to talk about how to do it, but it is possible using extensions to add environment values to environment values. Again, the same treatment. What is the wrap value of environment? It is the value of some bar in environment values. And what does environment do, that struct do, when you get and set, it sets and gets that value in environment values. And what is its projected value? None. Property wrappers are allowed to have no projected value, and at the environment indeed has no projected value. Publisher. So again, publisher, very deep topic, a lot to talk about. We are not going to take all the time we talk about today. I'm just going to give you the light treatment, the overview, so you get an idea of generally what this is all about. So a publisher is conceptually really simple. Its kind of declaration will look something like this. Publisher with two don't cares, the blue output, the red failure there. And the output is just some type that this publisher periodically emits. It publishes it out into the world. And the failure is the type of struct or information that it gives if it should fail to publish for whatever reason. You know, maybe it's publishing something from over the network and the network connection goes dead and it has to fail and tell you what happened, for example. A common failure is the failure never. You see the green never right there. And that failure means I don't ever fail. I publish my values, la la la, I'm publishing them and I never fail, nothing can go wrong that would cause me to fail. And that's quite a common failure mode. What can we do with a publisher? We got a publisher and we know it publishes a certain type of thing and that it might fail with a certain kind of failure. What can we do with it? Well, the number of the one thing we do with publishers is we listen to them. We listen to the values they're publishing and we do something with the values. That's, that's why publishers exist, so we can listen to them. But we also often are transforming the values that are coming out of a publisher 
on the fly, taking actions, converting it to publish something slightly different than it would usually publish, to kind of massage it into something that periodically gives us what we really want. So that's a lot of the API publishers about transforming it. And we can also shuttle its values kind of off into other places as well as they're coming out. And there's a lot more, but again, I'm not gonna be talking about anything but the basics today. So let's talk about listening to a publisher. We call that subscribing. There's a whole protocol called subscriber. And I'm only gonna talk about two ways to subscribe to a publisher, two of the most common ways out there to do it. One is to execute a closure whenever the publisher publishes its data or when it finishes, either because it failed or it just completed normally. And the name of this function is dot sync. This is a function in on a publisher. You say dot sync, and it has two arguments, receive completion, which takes a closure, and receive value, which takes a closure. The receive completion closure is given the completion enum. The completion enum basically has two states. It succeeded or it failed. And if it failed, it's got the associated value of whatever the failure information is. And then receive value, it's just a closure that takes whatever just last got emitted. So as the publisher emits its values, it's constantly emitting them, this receive value closure is constantly being called until it fails or completes, and then the other one gets called. Now, one thing to note here is that if the publisher's failure is never, so it never fails, then you can call sync without specifying that receive completion because it's never going to call your receive completion because it never completes, it never fails. So you can just skip that. And that's a common thing to do again. Notice that sync here returns something. I've made it in purple because it's actually quite important. This thing that it returns uh, implements this cancelable protocol, which is a very simple protocol. But very often it gets type erased, and sync does this, where it type erases the return to be any cancelable. This is just like we do with transitions, right, where we had any transition to make it easier to deal with. Same thing here. So sync returns an any cancelable. And what is the purpose of this purple thing that we get back from the sync function? Well, two purposes. Number one, you can send dot cancel to it. That's what's in the cancelable protocol, dot cancel. And if you call a cancel function on this purple thing, then it'll stop syncing. That sync will stop executing the closures in there. So then it goes away, stop subscribing to that publisher essentially. So that's valuable. Well, we surprisingly don't do that that often, but it's still valuable. But B is the big deal in that it keeps dot sync alive. So as long as that var cancelable exists, then sync keeps syncing. So the cancelable would never be a local variable here. If you made that a local variable, then as soon as the method finishes, the function that you're in finishes, the sync would stop syncing. This cancelable almost always is going to be a property, an instance variable on a struct or a class, and that is going to make this sync last as long as that struct or class lasts. Because as soon as that struct or class goes away, not used anymore, then its vars, of course, go away with it. And when its var is one of these cancelables and it goes away, the sync will stop listening to the publisher, which is kind of exactly what you want. So the return value of sync is used to cancel, but even more importantly, in a way, it's used to decide how long the sync keeps listening to the publisher. As long as that var exists somewhere, it's going to keep listening. We talked about sync as one way to listen to a publisher. Another way is for a view to listen to a publisher. And this is super simple. There is a view modifier on view called dot on receive. You give it the publisher and a closure. And that argument to the closure is the thing the publisher emits. And this closure will be called every time that publisher publishes and your view will get invalidated, causing it to redraw. This is an awesome little function. Great way to hook your view up to some source of data. And every time that data gets published, whoo, your view does something. You, know, you put any code you want in there and the do whatever you want part of that. And then you also get redrawn. It's just a fantastic little feature. Where do publishers come from? How do I get a hold of a publisher? They sound great, but where do I get one? Well, There's a lot of places to get one. I'll talk about a few of the most common ones here. One is to dollar sign projected value of an at sign published. Okay, you have view model, it's 
publishing a bunch of its VARs. And uh, you can use the dollar sign to get a publisher and find out when things are changing. And we're going to do this in the demo. This is a very, probably the most common source in your views of getting a publisher. But some other objects have this as well. URL session has one. We talked briefly about what that is. That's for getting data off the network. Essentially, as a publisher, you give it a URL and it publishes the data that it goes and fetches when it's ready. That's pretty cool. Timer is another one. Timer, its publisher will publish the current date and time every however often you say. So you can have it publish the current date and time as a date object. That's, what, that's its published type every tenth of a second, every hundredth of, hundredth of a second, every hour, whatever you want, and it'll just publish periodically. And there's also another thing called Notification Center. It tells you about things going on in the system when things happen in the system, and you can set up a publisher there and it will publish these things called notifications, and you can find out what's going on. So that's another pretty cool publisher out there. So there's a lot more stuff we can do. Like I said, my goal today in both these slides and the demo is just to give you a flavor for what a publisher is. I'm not gonna exhaustively talk about the dozens and dozens of methods that are in Publisher, I certainly recommend you go look up the documentation for Publisher and just take a look in there just so you get a feel of what's in there because there's a lot of stuff in there. And hopefully the demo that I'm just about to do, which is gonna do some stuff with Publisher, will give you a more concrete feel of how we use these little data publishers. And by the way, Publisher also is in the same service of this single source of truth. The publisher wants to be publishing the data that is coming from the actual source of the data, and then the consumers are just consuming it on the fly as it gets published. So it's really part of that effort as well. So let's dive into that demo, and you can read here what I'm gonna do, but it's mostly about publishers and bindings. We're going to start by fixing a little bit of a sloppiness in our UI. Now, I'm going to run the app here, Emoji Art, and I want you to watch closely when it first launches that it'll start with a white background because it has to load its background image. But while it's doing that, it's still showing all the emoji that go on that document. And I think that looks pretty bad. So let's take a look at that. See, there we go. And then it appears. So really, we don't want it to do this. And this happens every time we add a new image. If I change the image to this, we get this momentary white background with the emoji. So I really only want to show these emoji when this is loaded. So how am I going to detect that situation? It's quite simple. I'm just going to go to my view over here. This is the for each where I show all of my emoji. I'm just going to say, if I'm not loading, then go ahead and show my emoji. So how do I know that I'm loading my background image? Pretty straightforward to detect, actually. Bar is loading the bool. And I'm just going to return whether my documents has a background URL set on it. And if my document does not have a background image, this tells me that I'm loading, right? I have a URL for a background, so I don't have a blank background and I don't have my image yet. So I must be loading it. Now, we didn't actually make background URL be gettable. If you remember in our view model here, background URL, we have a set, but this is not a gettable var. So let's fix that. Let's make this just a normal computed var. Background URL, type URL. And this is just the setter. So we'll put a little set in there. Of course, we're setting from the new value. And then our getter is also simple. That's just the emoji arts background URL. Now that our view is able to look at the background URL, and obviously you can already look at the background image, it can easily detect whether we're in the middle of loading. We still have one more thing to do, which is that since we changed background URL to a computer property, yeah, here we go. This is where we set the background URL. Now we have to say background URL equals that URL. I think that's all that we have to do. Let's go ahead and run. Oh, 
it was white before it loaded. And let's go pick our a very large document. This one takes a little while to load. Here we go. Boom. Ooh, nice, nice. But what would be even nicer is if we gave a little bit of feedback to the user. Hey, I'm loading that URL. Just give me a second. And we could easily do that just by putting some sort of image or an animating graphic or something up while we're in that loading stage. So just here, what we do if not loading is this. We could just as easily also have if loading, then do something like put up some kind of image or we'll put our emoji in the other case. So what kind of image we want to use here? Let's go ahead and do this system name stuff that I talked about in the slides. And this allows us to specify the name of one of the system images. And we're going to go look those up. I'm also going to make the image scale be large here, which makes this image kind of as large as it can be. These images are not huge images. They're mostly intended to be embedded near text. So they try to be about the same size as text. So this is mostly just trying to match up with large text, but we don't really need a huge image here. And if we wanted something huge, we could just create our own shape and maybe cool animated thing that shows loading. But we're just gonna do something simple here, which is this system image. Now, how do we find these system images? You'll remember we go to developer.apple.com slash design, and we download this app called SF Symbols. And it has tons and tons and tons of symbols that we could use. And they're even put into groups over here. We're trying to do a timer. I see one called time down here. Let's look at that. Hmm, this is some interesting one. Maybe timer right there would be a good one. And this is its exact name. So we can just go back in here and put that name timer and run. Let's see if we get a little timer. Oh, we got it. It was there for a little bit. Let's go load another image up here. Yeah, it puts a little timer there. Now, that little static timer, though, it's not very pretty. It's kind of boring. It'd be nice maybe if we had something that's animated there. Wouldn't it be cool if we could just say something like dot spinning that would just have a view modification to make whatever this view is be spinning? Well, unfortunately, there is no such thing. It would be nice to have one, but there isn't. So we're just going to make one ourselves. Go here, new file. This is going to be a view modifier, right? That spinning is a view modifier. I'm going to call it spinning. That's going to be the name of the modifier itself. And it's, of course, UI. And it's a struct spinning, which is a view modifier. And view modifiers have func body, which takes some content of some don't care type that returns some view. And we then just modify this with whatever things we want to do to make it the way we want. Clearly wants some rotation effect because we want it to spin. We've, we saw that animation before. Let's make an angle here with degrees being, well, when this thing is visible on screen, let's say we'll make it go over to 360 degrees, otherwise zero degrees. Now, how do we know if it's visible? Well, we're going to have to have some state for that. Now you know that this is just a state struct that takes whatever var we put here, like is visible, which is just a bool, and it stores it in the heap and keeps it in the heap even if this view is rebuilt. But we are going to have to set that thing when we appear. So in on appear, I'm going to say itself dot is visible equals true. And the other thing we need to do is put some implicit animation. So let's do that animation. Animation dot linear put a duration, uh, maybe one second to go all the way around. And of course it wants to repeat forever and it does not want to auto reverse. I don't think we ever need to stop this thing. Once it comes on screen, we'll just let it spin and spin. It's, it's making it so this view is always spinning. And let's also put our nice extension on view so that we have this funk spinning that we can just put on as a view modifier. And return some view, of course, which is our self modified with spinning. Hopefully you're getting pretty uh, comfortable now with these view modifiers. So watch carefully because it's only going to spin a short amount of time. Ah, there, I saw it spinning. I saw it spinning. Let's load something else. Oop, that was so fast. 
We couldn't even see it spinning. How about uh, this one? We know this is a big one. Let's try this. Oh, it's pretty good. And we could pick other images. Maybe I actually looked around and one I th thought that was kind of cool. I was searching time-based thing and I found hourglass. So I think hourglass looks pretty cool. Let's put that in there. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, yeah, kind of a little spinning hourglass. So giving that kind of feedback to users is always good. You never really want the your application's reaction to the user doing something to be it just nothing happens because then the user's not sure you really heard what it was asking what the user was asking you to do. So giving feedback back like that always a good idea. So let's dive into this publishers thing, which is our main one of our two main topics today. And the first thing I'm going to do with publishers is go back here where we did this workaround for property observers not really working with property wrappers. And we made this whole business here. And I'm going to undo this, just get rid of this whole thing. And I'm going to take our published and put it back. So we're not doing that workaround. And we're going to do it in a totally different way. What we're going to do is use the projected value of our published struct. Remember, that's the dollar emoji art. That is a publisher. And in specific, it's a publisher of emoji arts. So every time this emoji art changes, it publishes this emoji art again. And that is very valuable for us because every time this emoji art changes, we want to autosave. So let's just set that up in our init. I'm going to use that dollar emoji art, which is the publisher. And I'm going to use that thing we talked about, which is being able to sync the publisher to a function. Now, there's two versions of this sync right here. This one takes two arguments, receive completion and receive value. Both of them are closures. The first one is passing you a completion enum. And it's saying this publisher finished publishing. Now, our dollar published publishers don't ever send completions because they just are always publishing. They don't really ever stop. So their completion failure type is never, capital N never, that is their failure type. They never fail because they can't fail and also they don't complete. When you have that kind of publisher that doesn't specify any kind of failure, then you can use this simple version of sync that just gives you the values. And you can see that rece receive value right there is a just a closure that takes the thing that the publisher publishes, which is an emoji art, and returns nothing. So that means a closure takes an emoji art, and we can do whatever we want in here. And what I want to do in here is put it into user defaults. Let's auto save it. Let's go ahead and print our emoji arts JSON. So this will be able to see the JSON that's going on there. Notice that we have an error here, or warning anyway, result of call to sync is unused. And that's actually very bad, <laughs> okay? It really you never want the result of sync not to be used. So sync is what we call a subscriber. It's subscribing to what's going on in this publisher right here, right? It wants to find out, listen to what the publisher is publishing. So subscribers, when you create them, they almost always are going to give you what's called a cancelable. It's two functions, right? It You can cancel, but also it keeps it around. So if I were to do the code like this, like cancelable equal this, not only is cancelable never used, but when init ends, this is a local var, it gets thrown out, and so would this sync. So if we want this sync to live past the execution of this init, we need to do private var. Let's call this our auto save cancelable. And it's going to be of type any cancelable. And this any cancelable right here is just a type erased version of the cancelable for this. And the cancelable for this 
it really encapsulates all the things this subscriber is doing and subscribing to this publisher. So it can be kind of complicated. It's got all the output value of the publisher and the failure and all that is in there. And we just want it to be a simple bar that we can store to. So it gets type erased for us. Sync type erases whatever this cancelable stuff is so that we get this any cancelable exactly the same as we did for any transition. Now notice we got a bad error here, use of undeclared type, any cancelable. Why is this undeclared? Because all of this publisher stuff comes from a different framework called combine. And so the combine framework has the cancelable, subscribing, publishing, all that stuff comes from there. All we need to do to keep this sync around is to assign it's cancelable to this var that's in our view model, and it'll live as long as the view model does right now. Once this view model goes away, of course, this var will go away with it, and then this sync will stop. Now, in our app, our view model never goes away, but it's quite possible to have view models disappearing. If you have an app that has multiple screens, you might have a view model that's in charge of one screen, and when that screen goes away, the view model goes away too. And that's perfect. We wouldn't want this to be auto-saving when this view model is not around. So this is a really nice way to link up this subscriber to whatever object it's helping out. Let's go ahead and run and see if we're getting this JSON printed out on our console. We'll make a little room so we can see. And we can already see that it did like it looks like yeah, an initial auto save when we first brought this document up. And let's make a change to our document. I'm going to add, uh, let's see, a pretzel. Boop. Yep, now we have two pretzels. Maybe we'll add another pretzel. Yep, now we have three pretzels. One, two, three. So our auto save is working. Let's do another thing exactly like that actually because we have another published right here our background image is published what about this cool feature let's go back here what if when I add a new background let's say like this background right here drag this background watch what happens okay so it didn't quite fit the edges and it's even worse if I do a bigger one right here like this this guy It, we really want this like double tap to zoom to happen automatically whenever we set our background image to something else. And I'm going to go back and set it to this one. Oop, that's terrible. We'd really like it to go like that. So we already have this nice function zoom to fit. It would just be great if every time our background image changed, we called zoom to fit. Well, that's quite easy to do too, because we know when our background image gets set, it's when this var gets set, and this is a published, so there's a dollar background image var, which is a publisher that publishes this image, and we can use that in our view. So let's go look in our view over here and see how we would do that. I'm just gonna go, let's say, down here, and say dot on receive. so on receive is how we do that. I'm gonna say self.document dollar background image that's the background image publisher that's going to call a closure with the thing that got published when this was received so that's the ui image that got published here and i'm going to say self.zoom to fit that image in our geometry dot size that's it so now every time this thing publishes because a new image came in, you can even see the very first one does it. Let's go down here and make another image. How about this one? Loading, that's nice. And it zoomed to fit. So those publishers, really, really valuable to hook up to. And you'll get the hang of those dollar sign things and like, hmm, that's really cool. I, I want to know when that changed. I'll do on receive or um, I'll go in here and hook up async to it, for example. But there's more things we can do with publishers than just these dollar sign things that are published. I'm going to use a publisher to do this whole background image fetch. When we were doing this, I kind of mentioned that really we want to do this with a class called URL session because URL session knows how to do timeouts and all the setup and everything having to do with it. We really were just using data contents of right here, which is kind of a dumb, not so smart non-configurable way to fetch things. So let's use your URL session here to do this background 
Edge instead, and that is going to be done with a publisher. So first, how do we get a session, a URL session? We just say URL session, and it does have some initializers that you can see take this configuration. You can configure your URL session to have whatever timeouts you want, but it also has a nice one called shared. That's a static var, a shared URL session that your whole app can use when it just wants to do simple downloads. We'll use this one a lot when we're doing straightforward download where we don't care about the timeout, whatever, but we still want all the wonderfulness the URL session does. Now, how do we ask URL session to download something from a URL and how does it give it to us? Well, it does this with a publisher. So I'm going to say let publisher equal our session. It has this great function data task publisher for URL. And this is going to give us a publisher, and we all know what a publisher is, that is going to publish the contents of this URL, whatever. Once it goes out and fetches this, it publishes it. And let's take a closer look, actually, at publisher here in the documentation. This publisher that URL session creates is called a data task publisher. You click on it, go in here, and we know that publishers have output, don't care, and a failure, don't care. So let's look at URL sessions output don't care. What does it turn that output don't care into? It makes it into a tuple with the data it got back and this thing called a URL response, which is stuff like the suggested file name that it found on the other side and kind of URL-y oriented things. But this is usually what we're most interested in is this data that came back from that URL. Well, that's cool. And what about this failure? What happens when one of these URL session data task publishers fails, like network connection is not available or whatever? Well, its type is URL error. Remember, this is a don't care, and we're saying what type it is for this particular publisher. So it's URL error. Let's look at URL error. Here it is. And as things you might suspect, again, you know, a little localized description right here of what happened, some error codes, that kind of thing. So that's what most publishers look like. They just have some output, like that tuple of data and the response, and then also they have some failure possibly. Now, again, remember that these published guys, they don't have a failure. Their, their failure is never, because they don't ever fail. They just keep on, keep on, keep on on. This publisher is not publishing exactly what we want. We don't really want a tuple. What we want is an image, okay? We want, We'd be great if this publisher would take our URL and just publish an image to us. And then we would be able to put our image into our background image up here and everything would work perfectly. And so one of the main ways that we use publishers is we take an existing publisher and we kind of slowly coerce it into doing the things we want. And that is done by creating new publishers. So I'm going to take this publisher and I'm going to send it a message called map. And map takes a closure that gives you the information in the existing publisher, which for us is the data and the URL response. And it lets you return the type you'd rather it be. And I'd rather this be a UI image. And how do I make it? Just take the data that you pass me and map it. Now this publisher is no longer a publisher that returns that tuple and has an error of URL error. Instead, it has been mapped to be a publisher that publishes a UI image, and this is actually optional UI image because this is a failable initializer. So it publishes optional UI image, and it still has the URL error failure. So we just mapped this publisher into a different publisher. In some ways, publishers feel a lot like arrays because, you know, an array is a, like a list of values and a publisher is kind of a list of values, but it's over time. The publisher is publishing over time. So a lot of the functions in publisher mimic those in array. So that's great. So it's publishing UI images for us, but there's a problem. URL session does all of its work in one of those global background queues because, of course, you don't want to block the UI while you're fetching these things. So we want this publisher not to publish these UI images on those background threads, which is what it would do by default. So we wanted to publish this stuff on the main queue. And we can do that as well. We say dot receive on 
dispatch queue.main. And that turns this, this returns a publisher, a different publisher, a publisher that publishes UI images from this publisher being converted to there and publishes them on the main queue. So it's just slightly modified. Does this feel a lot like views and view <laughs> modifiers? It's the same kind of design, totally different system here because these are not UI things at all. But it's the same kind of idea where you're taking a publisher and modifying it, modifying it, same way as a view, a modify it, modify the exact same thing. Now, the last thing we want to do, this is pretty much in shape of the kind of publisher we want, is publishing UI images to it, is we would like to maybe use .sync or something. Like if I try to use .sync here, it's going to be interesting. Notice I didn't even get the sync option that only takes the value. Right, the dot sync that we used up here only just takes whatever it's publishing. I didn't, there's no error here because, again, these published things, their error is never. So it's no use handling a never error. So we don't even get this option down here below. Why does this not even give us the option for that? Well, our publisher that's publishing UI images here is still having the failure of URL error. I don't really want to handle errors. If I did, I might well use sync right here, but I don't want to handle errors. All I really want to do is just give me that UI image. And if you get an error, I just want nil. Okay, just give me nil. Well, it turns out we can do that. We can modify our publisher a little further here and say replace errors with some other UI image. I'm going to pick the UI image nil. So now this publisher publishes UI images, optional UI images still, but its error type has been changed to never. And now we could do sync. And look, there's the values available now. But I'm not even going to use sync. So I'm going to say let canceler equal something. But I'm not going to have it do sync. I'm going to have it do a really cool subscriber called assign. So assign lets you assign the output of the publisher to some var that you specify using this key path syntax that we saw before on some object, or in our case, ourself. So this is going to take whatever this publisher publishes and assign it to this var. And this will work as long as this var, background image, has the same type, UI image, an optional UI image, as what the publisher is publishing. And that is exactly what our publisher publishes. Now, assign only works if you have never as your error. So you, if you have something from publisher that has an error, you're going to have to call replace error and provide some value to return from this publisher if there is an error. In our case, it's easy because our UI image is an optional, so we could return nil. But if you're publishing something that's not an optional, you're going to have to figure out something reasonable to publish there if you want to have your failure type be never by calling replace error. And this emoji art document here, we can just let Swift infer that from the fact that we know this key path is on self. This is just a subscriber. That's why it has a canceler over here. And of course, we don't want this canceler to be a local variable inside this function. Otherwise, when this function ends, this assignment, this subscriber is going away. Exactly the same as we did up here when we had autosave cancelable. We're going to need to have some private var, which I'm going to call my fetch image canceler. Cancelable. cancelable. Again, any cancelable it's type. And I'm going to use this as the, assign, the variable to put that subscribers cancelable into. And that's going to keep it around as long as this stays around. But don't forget that this also has the benefit of letting me cancel this. And remember when we did all the fetching ourselves, we had to be careful that if someone clicked on a background image and it was on a slow server and it was taking too long and they dragged in a different image from a fast server and that worked. And then 10 seconds later, the slow server finally responded and it blew out the image. And we fixed that by having to check, oh, is this image that just arrived the same one we're looking for? Well, with this system, we don't have to do any of that. Because I'm just going to say right here, I'm only going to do all this after I've taken my fetch image cancelable and canceled the previous one. This is also going to keep us from having outstanding requests that we're not interested in anymore. Every time we fetch the background image data, I'm going to cancel the previous one 
and go get the new one. So now I don't have to worry about that thing changing because so, I'm only going to be ever fetching the new one. So it's a really cool feature of publishers as well is that you can cancel them and they'll stop doing their work. Now the only other thing we would do with this code is we'd make this a one-liner. So we would take this shared session and we would put it right here and we would take this whole publisher and we would put it right here and we wouldn't have these two intermediate variables. Pretty sweet, pretty simple, pretty elegant solution to getting data. Just ask the URL session to go fetch it and it publishes the result. We massage it into the format we want and then just assign it to one of our variables. And with background image being set over here, that's gonna cause this publisher to fire which is over here going to cause this on receive to notice and cause a zoom to fit. So you start to see this reactive UI thing. It starts all the way from like pulling things over the network and ripples all the way through in a very natural way. We'll see this thing in action. Loading. Woo, it worked. Okay, how about, uh, where's our other favorite one? Uh, to reload here. Here it is. Perfect. All right, that's it for publishers. We guys, we saw a lot going on with publishers there, but we really only just scratched the surface of it. There's a lot more to know, and I will cover it later in the quarter. You, as always, you can go look in the documentation for publisher and see the many, many different functions you can call besides map and replace error and all these things. Just so much in there. But now we're going to move on to some UI stuff. I am going to make it so that we, instead of having just this one kind of sad little palette right here, that we can have many palettes, a food palette, animal palette, faces palette, so we can choose through all kinds of emoji to build our beautiful artwork. So let's start by building that little thing. This little chooser is just gonna be its own little view. So I'm just gonna go back here, file new. It is gonna be a Swift UI view. I'm gonna call it palette chooser and we all know how to make a view now we just replace its body mine's going to have an h stack of something called a stepper which we're going to talk about in a second and then also just the text of the palette name which we're going to have to get as we choose different palettes this is going to be the name of the palette all we want our palettes to have nice names like food animals faces whatever so what is this stepper? The stepper is essentially like a little plus minus button, and it might not be the real perfect UI here for this, but it, it's quite functional. And it also lets me show you stepper because I wanted to show it. So stepper has a lot of different initializers. You should check the documentation. For example, it can take a range and then so you can step through the range. It also lets you just kind of free form have a stepper that just does on increment it does one thing and then on decrement it does another so we're going to use that version so on increment we'll specify some closure and on decrement we'll specify some closure and steppers have labels i'm going to have my label here be a text that says mm, choose palette generally the steppers label tries to explain what the stepper is, is doing I think it's going to be pretty obvious in our app, so it might be that we're going to lose this, just get rid of this text, but we'll see how it looks. I want you to see where the label appears on a stepper. So before we start implementing the actual stepper stepping through our palette, let's see what our view looks like right here. So I'm going to actually bring out our canvas. Let's see if we can take a look at it here. Yeah, it looks like we have a little bit of a problem here. Let's hit diagnostics. Oh, I think I recognize this problem. This is the problem that many of you had in your assignment three. And your assignment three write-up explains how to work around this problem. What's going on here is that Xcode is getting a little confused because we have the name of a struct that is exactly the same as the name of our app. And Xcode doesn't quite do the right thing here. This was probably even more of a problem for your assignment three since Swift itself has a struct named set. So the two workarounds for this are either to rename the offending struct or to rename the app. So I'm going to rename my app. That's the simple thing to do. 
So I'm going to go over here to my settings, pick my app under targets, and we'll change our name from emoji art to emoji space art. That might be a better name. Anyway, so let's go back and resume again. We can see our stepper right here. And this is kind of in the ballpark of what we want, but not exactly what we want. This is the label of it, choose palette. And then this is the plus minus, the stepper. And then this is the palette name. So this part I like, but so this H stack is using all the space available, the whole width right here. And that's why it's so spread out. But we'll work on it. We'll see how it goes. But it's kind of in the ballpark of what I want. So let's put this palette chooser now in our main view. We're going to put it in an H stack with our scroll view, right? This is the scroll view that shows the palette. So let's make an H stack with our palette chooser in there. And then this scroll view also in there. And we'll run. All right, well, we're making some progress. This is kind of what I want, this thing right here. But I definitely don't want this choose palette. It's really not necessary. It's kind of obvious that this is going to be plus minusing whatever my palette name is here, food or animals or whatever. I'm definitely going to ditch that uh, over there. I'll do that by making this be an empty view. So let's see how that looks. Hmm. Still not quite right. It looks like it's giving an equal amount of space to my palette view as it is to the actual scroll view. I really want this to not get as much space as this. So we're going to try something. Let, let's try doing back in our main view, having the scroll view get to get a very high layout priority. Make it layout priority one. The default layout layout priority is zero. So hopefully this will fix our problem. Uh, oops. Mm. Well, this is interesting. It definitely gave a lot more space to our scroll view, but it didn't give enough space now to our palette chooser. Just kind of smash it over here and not enough space. So this is really not the right solution. It's close, but it's not the right solution. The real way we want to do this is to have our palette chooser over here fix its size. So we want it to be fixed size in the horizontal direction. True, vertically we don't care, false. And fixed size means that it's going to kind of size itself to fit and not going to use any extra space that's offered to it. And we'll see what this looks like. Oh, it looks much, much better. Okay, we got ditch the title and now it's kind of, instead of using, using all this space, it's setting itself up in the middle right here. And I have a feeling that's going to look good in our UI here as well. And indeed it does. And it doesn't look like any quite so much horizontal padding now. This stepper has its own, you can see, has its own little padding around it. So that horizontal padding that we had done over here, probably completely unnecessary. All right, so I'm liking the look of this. And what I want is that when I press these plus and minus buttons, it cycles through all the palettes that I have, food, faces, animals, whatever palettes that I have or that I've created. I want it to cycle through them. So how am I going to do that? Well, I don't want to waste too much of our time in demo. How do we get an array of palettes and step through them and all that? So I actually did that offline. This little code right here, which you all have from the forums, was posted for this lecture. And we're not going to go through all this, but it has some default palettes in here. And it lets you add and remove emoji from a palette. And it has these really two very good functions for steppers, which is give me the palette after some other palette and give me the palette before some other palette. So I'm going to use those to do my stepper before and after. So inside my palette chooser, I need some state of the palette that I've chosen. So I'm going to add an at sign state bar here. By the way, state bar should almost always be private. 
they can be private they should the only time it might not be private is if you're letting someone initialize them when they create your thing but you know this state in an at sign state is private to your view it can only be really looked at seen by your view so we almost always mark those private I'm going to call this chosen palette. It's going to be the chosen palette, which is a string. And we'll start it out just being nothing here. And then I'm going to have my stepper just when I hit plus, it's going to go to the palette after this one. And when I hit minus, it's going to go to the one before. That's easy. Self dot chosen palette equals my document. So I need my document here. Somehow I need my document so that I can say palette after my cho so current self.chosen palette. So I need my document. So let's go ahead and put that up here. We can do that. Observed object bar document, which is an emoji art document. It does mean, however, that when we create our palette chooser over here, see palette chooser, we're gonna have to pass the document along. Pass our document up here into our palette chooser, which is fine. We can do that. We'll see a different way to do that next time, but it'll work for now. And then when we decrement, we're gonna say self.chosen palette equals self.document.palette before. So let's just increment and decrement them. The other thing is we don't wanna say palette name here. We actually want the name of the palette. I have a nice little dictionary for that and say the text here is document.palette names chosen palette and if i can't find it i'm just going to have an empty name palette chooser down here let's just put, create an empty document for it emoji art document and run so here we go it starts out with a palette nothing but if i start cycling through woo, look at that activities animals faces food now the interesting thing is it's definitely cycling through my available palettes, which you can see over here, faces, food, animal activity, but it's not changing the palettes to actually be that. This palette is staying this kind of sad little palette here. Well, that makes perfect sense because our palette chooser is just choosing it inside local state in its view. It's not choosing it anywhere else. It's just setting this little chosen palette right here. By the way, I could probably also fix this problem where it comes up with no palette by doing something like on appear, and in that say my chosen palette equals my documents default palette. And I'm doing this in on appear rather than trying to do this, for example, up here. Can't do it up here because here we're in the initialization process and this var has not been initialized yet. So whenever you find yourself saying, oh, I, I want to initialize some state from some other var from my observed object, no problem. Just hold on, set it to zero or something, nil, empty string, and then on appear, you can do it. Voila. So we fixed our problem where we weren't having an initial palette shown there and our palette chooser pretty much ready to go here. However, we're really not doing anything with our palettes in our main scrollable palette over here. So we need to get that thing to start showing the chosen palette. So let's start by at least getting it to show the default palette. And we're gonna do that by creating some state over here in our main view, at sign state bar chosen palette string equals nothing i'll even do the same trick over here on up here uh, i'm copying and pasting code uh, that's probably going to be a problem but we'll see that that problem is not going to matter in just mere moments and now instead of saying the moji art palette i'm going to say my chosen palette i'm going to use my chosen palette instead that's all i need to do to start using the default palette. And look, it even lines up because this is using the default palette. Oh, let's go to the next one. Uh-oh, food, that's not food. Oh, it's not working. So what's going on here? Why is this chosen palette changing? This one's not. Well, it's because this chosen palette is in one state bar in this view. 
And this chosen palette is in a different state bar in another view. So these things have nothing to do with it. The only thing that's the same is their name, but they're totally different state. But clearly we want these two things to be the same. And we do this with a binding. So instead of having its own state here in the palette chooser, it's just going to have a binding. And bindings are usually not private because we're going to be setting them from outside somehow. And also bindings, we don't initialize them because a binding means that this var is going to get and set its value from some other var somewhere else. So presumably that some other var somewhere else is the thing that's going to have, be initialized. All right, so how do we set up the binding between this chosen palette and this chosen palette? Well, we just pass it. It's very simple. We just say chosen palette because chosen palette is just a var. It's nothing more than a var in palette chooser, and we're creating a palette chooser over there so we can set any unset vars. We're setting this unset var. We can send this one as, set this one as well. And what we set it to, though, is the projected value of our chosen palette. So this state, remember, it has a dollar sign as well, but it's not a publisher. That's the dollar sign of at sign publish. The dollar sign of an at sign state is a binding to this chosen palette. So that's why I can pass it here. Dollar chosen palette matches the type of this var, which is a binding to this string. Now, because I'm binding these two things together, this thing and this, I don't need to do on appear in one or the other of them. So let's just not do the on appear here. The on appear is going to happen over here. It's going to set that, and that's going to communicate through the binding to this guy. And he's going to see the same thing. And same when he chooses an increment or decrement, it's going to communicate back through the binding the other way. Now, before we can run, we have to fix our preview because our preview needs a chosen palette argument because it's creating it. What is a preview pass? There are actually ways to make a preview have a live binding, but it's way beyond the scope of what we're doing here. So I'm going to pass a dot constant binding. And I'm going to have that binding be doesn't really matter. It can be any string. So this chosen palette in my preview is going to be bound to the palette nothingness there, empty string. Clicking the plus minus is not going to do anything in my preview. All right, let's take a look. Okay, they're synced up. This looks like animals. This is animals. How about plus? Woo! Faces, food, activities, animals. So this kind of binding, or rebinding to views state, really crucial in Swift UI. I'm amazed we got all the way through four weeks of this course and we managed to avoid talking about bindings. Really important. And not just binding between two of our own views, okay, our emoji art document view and our palette chooser view, but binding between our views and Swift UI's views, especially things like text fields. That's how we get the text out of the text field that someone's typing in, or toggles where we're toggling something on or off. We'll have a binding to a bool when we do that. Even things like I'm going to put another view on screen in a way that kind of takes over the screen, and when it's done, it's going to let me know through a binding drug boolean binding and says yeah i'm done or not so we're going to see all that in the next few lectures a lot of use of this binding so get used to seeing it and that's it for today so we'll pick up with this next time for more please visit us at stanford.edu